guys help us welcome the, the man, man, the myth, the legend, Pastor Paul. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Hey. Joe and David are grounded from Red Bull and announcements. <laughs> they are, that's not going to happen again for a very long time. So <laughs> it was hard for me to come out here, to be honest with you, after. Anyway, I heard a lot more groaning than I did laughing, Joe. Uh, yeah, it was a good effort. So, hey, great to be with you. Can we, can we just thank Joe and David for the announcement? They did a good job this morning. Hey, we want to welcome everybody, whether you're joining us online or you're in Softer Sunday, it's great to have you with us. And good things are happening. The church is continuing to grow. And really, like, people are wondering, like, what's going on? Why is this happening? You know, the Bible says it this way. It says, one person sows, another person waters, but God gives growth. And we believe, like, if you're here or you're joining us online, we believe that God's bringing you here to be a part of what he's doing and what's happening. And, and we also believe, like, if you're new or you're part of what's happening and you're kind of coming into the church, like, we want to roll out the red carpet. We believe that God's brought you here. And we're just excited that you're, you're with us. And um, those of you who are joining us online, I know there are lots. We love you, and uh, our hearts are, are with you, and we're excited you're a part of what's happening. So we're in this series called Masterpiece, and we started last week, we talked about the reality that you're not just a piece of work, but you're God's masterpiece, right? Like, you're, God has a plan and a purpose for your life. How many of you have ever been called a piece of work before? Those are only the people who know that they've been called a piece of work, right? Like, um, but we, you know, and we talked about Ephesians 2.10, look at this verse, it says, for we are God's masterpiece, he has created us a new in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. That we're God's masterpiece, and it's not a, it's not a me thing, it's a we thing, right? Like, we're God's masterpiece, we are God's masterpiece. He created us, us, a new in Christ. It's we and us, we and us. No one ever wrote a masterpiece of music with a single note. And no one ever painted a masterpiece painting with a single stroke of a paintbrush. How many of you know it's the collection of notes together that makes a musical masterpiece? And it's the collection of paint, the brushes together. Now, if I'm painting, it's not gonna, it's gonna be a mess, not a masterpiece. But it's, it's the collection of that together that makes the masterpiece. And so we just talked about what God is doing in us last week. And Today, what I want to focus on for the next few minutes is what is this going to look like in our life? Like, when God's masterpiece is complete, when we become who he's created us to be, when the church collectively, we are who he made us to be, what's it going to look like? That's what Paul's going to talk about here in this next section of scripture. So, if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, and you can pull it out on your phone, or you can and pull out your Bible, or we'll have the verses up on the screen so you can follow along. But again, in Ephesians 2, it says, we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew. Everybody say anew. Like you're, you're born, Jesus said it this way, you're born again, like you have a fresh start. When we're created anew, we're not complete yet. We're, we're, it's like a baby being born, right? How many of you know a baby, when they're born, they're, they're totally there, and yet they're not totally there? How many of you know what I mean? Like they haven't fully become what they're created to be. The male frontal lobe isn't fully developed till you're 50 years old. I mean, like, there's like things that have to happen. Some say it takes a little longer. Like, um, but like, we have a lot to learn. Matter of fact, one of my favorite stories that just came back from camp, we had a right around 200 kids and students that went to camp this past year over the summer months. And one of the stories that came back was, was from one of the kids, one of the guys from our church was working at camp as a counselor and the one of the kids named Hank came down to the altar. He wanted prayer, and he's hanging down at the altar, and the, the guy from our church was like, Hank, have you ever given your life to Jesus? And Hank's like, I don't know that I have. And so he, this guy from our church prayed with Hank, and he said, Hank, now you can call yourself a Christian. You've given your life to Jesus. Now you can call yourself a Christian. And Hank's like, I don't want to call myself a Christian. And, he, and the guy at the altar said, why not? He pointed to Pastor Christian. He goes, he's a Christian already, all right? I want to be Hank. Like, how many of you know, like, it takes some understanding for this in our life to get the lingo, like, we're, we're created anew. It's like a baby being born. And so 
what we're going to look at today is like, where are we going? What are we going to look like collectively? What are we going to look like individually as we become the masterpiece God created us to be? And Paul's going to take us back to Jesus because everything starts and finishes with Jesus in our life. He really does. This is why we're a Christ-centered church. The church should be all about Jesus. When we come together to worship, it's Jesus' party. It's not your party. If we don't sing your song, we're sorry. We're singing songs to Jesus, right? Like If it doesn't go the way that you want, like this isn't about you or me. This is about worshiping Jesus. It's his party. And so we want to keep him at the center. So Ephesians 4, verse 8, we're going to start there. And this is what Paul writes. It says, therefore, it says, when he, everybody say he. Who's he? Jesus, right? Like, I was just checking to make sure you're paying attention. Therefore, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. This is where Paul says that Jesus ascended into heaven. Uh, we, We can read about this in the Gospels, that Jesus came to earth he, he lived among us for 33 and a half years. He died a cruel death on a cross. He was buried in a tomb. Three days later, he rose again, and he ascended back in to heaven. This is what Christians believe. There were lots of people there that saw this event. Can you, how many of you ever think about this? Like, How many of you would have liked to have been there just for a minute? Like, This has got to be one of the craziest things that you've ever... Like, Think about this for a minute. Like, You're just standing there. You're talking to Jesus. You're already tripped out. Like, This guy was dead. He was buried. Now he's alive. And then like, like, up, up, up. Like, How many of you think that is weird? Seriously, like... Well, I was there. I saw Jesus. Like, he just went up into heaven. No, like, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's it's not Superman. It's Jesus, right? Like, there he goes. It's incredible. Paul said this is what happened. And actually, in verse 8, he's quoting from Psalm 68. This is actually Paul quoting a verse from the Old Testament. In the middle of your Bible, there's this book called Psalms. There's 150 Psalms. This is Psalm 68, and he's quoting this psalm that says there's this king who won a great victory, and as he ascended to his throne, the psalm says the king uh, received gifts from men. But Paul changes it. He says that when King Jesus ascended, it's not that he received gifts from men, he gave gifts to men. How many of you think Jesus turns everything upside down? Would you agree? Like, he changes everything. I mean, we, the, the way we measure time changed with Jesus. Jesus said things, blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor in spirit, Ble- you know, blessed are those who are, are lowly. Like, Jesus changes the whole dynamic of how we view the world. And instead of receiving gifts, he gives gifts to men. Why did Jesus ascend into heaven? Well, because he came to earth. Look what it says in verse 9. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth, like he went into the earth. So when Jesus came to earth 2,000 years ago, he came as a God-man. He was, he, 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 God became a man, and he dwelt among us. And again, doesn't this sound crazy? Like God took on flesh, he lived among us. He was 100% God, and he was 100% man at the same time. And he dwelt among us. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He gave life to us. This is a real thing. Like Christians believe this is a real thing. This isn't a made up Greek mythology kind of thing. This isn't some storybook kind of thing or kind of, kind of, you know, Jesus was kind of here, kind of not. Like this is a real thing. He lived. He died. He was buried in the earth. He was laid to rest in the, in the tomb of a rich man named Joseph of Arimathea. And then after three days, he was raised from the dead. Here's the thing, you know, in the last uh, several years, in the last couple years with COVID and everything that's gone on, like there's a lot of people here in this service, there are people watching online, and you've lost loved ones. There's people in this room, you've lost loved ones, maybe not just in the last two years, but three years, five years, 10 years. Can I just say this, that God understands what it is to lose someone, to, to have someone that you love die and be buried. And God also knows how to raise up those who follow him from the dead, just like he did for Jesus. I just find a lot of comfort in this reality that God understands what we go through. So Jesus, he came, and there's a lot of different reasons the Bible says Jesus came. 
Uh, the Bible says he came to seek and save those who were lost. How many are grateful Jesus came to do that? It, the Bible says that Jesus came to make the invisible God visible, like he dwelt among us so that we could see what God was like. Now, the Apostle Paul says he explains why Jesus came, why he came to earth, and why he ascended back into heaven. Look at verse 10. It says, He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might, what does it say? That he might do what? Fill all things. Other translations say, fill all things with himself, to fill the earth with himself. Now, this is kind of trippy, but this is why Jesus came. He came to earth, died a death on a cross, was buried in the grave, rose from the dead, went back to heaven so that he could fill the earth with himself. What, what, what is this talking about? God wants to fill the world with Jesus. He wants to make the invisible God visible. This was his plan from the beginning. Do you remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? God created a guy named Adam, a woman named Eve. They're in the Garden of Eden, and God's first command to them was this. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Right? Doesn't it sound like what Jesus is doing right here? Like, I want to fill the earth. It says in the Bible that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, and that God, through humanity, wanted to fill the earth with his image bearers. My wife and I have done our part. We have four kids. We're going to have six grandkids. The rest of you, let's get at it, all right? Like, fill the earth, right? Like, this is the idea. And this is why Jesus came. Jesus came because he wants the earth to be filled with image bearers of God. That's who Jesus was. He came to make the invisible God visible. This is God's masterpiece. This is what God is up to. This is what God is doing. He wants to fill the earth with his glory and his person in his presence one day there'll be a new heaven there's going to be a new earth and a new humanity and you're going to look around and you're going to say oh this is amazing like go god this is incredible now how many of you know today when we look around we say oh god not go god right like like things are kind of messed up how many of you are sitting next to a messed up person right now raise your hand all right like like things aren't perfect I, I kind of picture it like my, um, my third granddaughter, her name's Nora, and she likes to go for rides. She calls them rides. She's like, a, she's a little over a year, ride. And, and I, if I'll say this to her, I say, wee. Nora's like, ride. Because when we go for rides in a beat up Toyota on our 20 acres, this is what we do. We go down a hill. And by the way, Nora, like at a little over a year, already she knows how to turn the blinkers on. She knows how to spray windshield wiper solvent. She knows how to turn the wipers on. I don't have any music in the vehicle, but like she can, like she loves everything. And this is the whole, all the noise we make on the whole trip. When we go down hills, she says, wee. And when we see antelope, she's like, wow, right? And this is, that's our whole trip that consists of those two words. I think that when there's a new heaven and a new earth and God remakes everything the way he wants it, we're going to drive around going, wee, and wow. Like, it's amazing. And this is what Paul's writing about here. He wants to fill the whole earth with himself. Matter of fact, this is such a big deal to God. There's, there's this passage in Numbers. I'm going to read it to you in just a minute. There's this time where uh, God's people, the nation of Israel, in the Old Testament where they, they like do things wrong, they disobey God, and God's like, you know what? You're not going to go into the promised land. I'm not going to let you go in. Now, how many of you have ever kind of used phrases before, like that you're, you're saying, like, it's never going to happen? How many of you ever used phrases like, when pigs fly, right? That's going to happen. When or when the Detroit Lions win a Super Bowl, that's when it's going to, or when hell freezes over, right? Like, how many of you know when hell freezes over, that's when the Lions will win a Super Bowl? So... Like, like it's, it's, it's like it's never going to happen. And so in Numbers 14, verse 21, God's like, hey, like, uh, uh, you're not going in. And listen to what he says. As truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of you will see the land. Like God's like, I'm telling you, as surely as I'm alive and as surely as one day my glory will fill the earth. Like, uh, people will reflect my image. As surely as that's going to happen, you're not going into the land. Like, this is, a, this is a big deal to God. 
How will the world be filled with Jesus through you and me? That's what Ephesians is all about. Through you and me, the good work for which you were created in Christ Jesus is to be an image bearer of God in this planet. That's why you were created. Some of you are going to be purple-haired image bearers of Jesus. Some of you are going to be bald guy image bearers of Jesus. Some of you are going to be rock and roll fan image bearers of Jesus. Some of you are going to be Democrat image bearers of Jesus. Some of you are going to be Republican image bearers of Jesus. Some of you are going to be whatever you might be, image bearers of Jesus. You're created anew in Christ. For this amazing good work that you'll bear the image of Jesus, it will fill the world with Jesus. How many of you think this is kind of hard to believe, not for yourself, but people that are sitting around you? How many of you are like, I know someone, and they don't look very much like Jesus? Like, how many of you think some of you are like, I am not raising my hand right now, right? Like, or, or like, I can't imagine that my life, like, I, I can't imagine it's going to actually look like Jesus, but it will. We're here to fill the world with reflections of Jesus. So several weeks ago, our uh, newest granddaughter, Sarah, was born. And she came home from the hospital a couple days after she was born. Then she contracted RSV. She had to go back in the hospital. She was in the hospital for 11 days. She just came home again. She's on oxygen right now. So many of you have been praying for her. Thank you for doing that. And people delivered meals. And I'll never forget what happened on day five, though, when Sarah was in the hospital. We get a text from my son, and he, he just texted uh, my wife and was like, you know, the most amazing things happened. He said, ever since we've been in the hospital, and his wife, Haley, has been staying right up in the room with the baby, every day this nurse arrives into the room every morning with a cup of coffee for Haley. Brings her a cup of coffee. On day five, Caleb says, you won't believe what happened, but the lady, this nurse, she comes in with a whole box of Costco diapers for us. Like, this is it. How many know this is not the nurse's job, right, to bring coffee and deliver diapers? But how many of you know she's being a reflection of Christ to those around her? And this is amazing. How many of you know that one day the whole earth will be filled with the glory of God? Like, people will be ministering and doing things and representing Jesus, whether it's a cup of cold water or a hot coffee or a box of diapers, whatever it is we're doing. How many know she's not just a nurse, she's there to represent Jesus wherever she's at? And we're not just, we're not just hey, a doctor, or a lawyer, or a dad, or a mom. Like we're, we're going to be representing Jesus and bearing his image, and God will fill the whole earth with his glory. Now here, Paul explains how it's going to happen, ver- verses 11 and 12. Look what he says. So Jesus gives gifts to people. He gave the apostles the prophets, evangelists, shepherds or pastors and teachers to equip the saints. Everybody say the saints. Saints. Do you know who the saints are? It's not the Carroll College football team, all right, yeah. Like we love them, but that's not the saints. It's not even special people who've done miracles and achieved great things. You know who the saints are? If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are a saint. Isn't that amazing? Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a saint. Tell them that right now. You're a saint. Like, so you're like, I am not telling them that. They weren't behaving this morning, you know, like. But it says that, look at this. He gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. This is to carry on the ministry of Jesus for the building up the body of Christ. Jesus gives gifts to the church, his body. He gives these apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. Look up here for a second. This is super important for you to get. These are not special people. These are people with special gifts. Okay, How many of you know I am no different than you are? I put, I put my jeans on this morning. They were a little snug getting them on, okay? I'm a little overweight. Like, like I, I'm no different. Like, and sometimes we think, well, you know, you're, you're a special person. No, I'm not a special person. People singing this morning are not, well, they're kind of special in their own way. The announcement people, like, like, nobody's above or beyond. Like, we're just, we happen to be equippers. Matter of fact, one time I had a lady, this happened at Helena First. A lady said to me after a prayer time, like, I, I wasn't praying for people at the altar. We had... We had different prayer teams down, and people were praying for people, and this lady contacted me, and she goes, you know, you're not too good to pray for people. I was like, oh, wah, wah, wah. Like, no, I didn't send. Like, how many of you have ever had to hold off sending emails, right? 
And I, I just, she misunderstood because the reason I wasn't at the altar praying for people is because my job is to equip other people and other people get to do the work of the ministry. How many of you know God answers your prayer just as much as he answers my prayer? Right? Like, it's not like, hey, these are a special group of people. No, these people, and matter of fact, um, I, I think I have an amazing job. Like he says here that pastors are on this list. I have a great job. My job is to put you to work. Like, how many think I got an amazing job? Like, my job's to equip you. Your job's to do the work, the work of the ministry. I like it. Like, I, I lo- how many of you want my job? I'd like to give it to you right now. Like, no, like, like it, it's great. And um, we are called saints, the body of Christ. Like, we are, we're Jesus in disguise. Like, how many of you know when Jesus came to earth, he was God who dwelt among us, and yet the world saw Jesus, and they didn't recognize who he was, right? And often the world's going to look at us and they're not going to recognize uh, Jesus either. Like we're Jesus in disguise. Jesus is a bald guy living through me right now. Like, or, or Jesus is living through you. And, and often the world's not going to see or understand. Now, let me highlight this because some of us aren't serving or doing the work of the ministry. This happens all the time. Like Jesus says, hey, I'm going to give these people to you. They're going to equip you. You're going to do the work of the ministry. And I know a lot of people like, I'm not serving yet. I'm not going to to do any ministry because I'm not qualified. Like, I'm not good enough to be serving. And if you think that, then you're mistaken because serving, it's not like you have to reach a certain level to serve. Actually, serving is what's going to help you grow and be more like Jesus, not the other way around. Ministry doesn't come after maturity, it leads to maturity. Serving is how we grow. It's not a matter of if you should be serving, it's a matter of where you should be serving. It's like so quiet in here right now. Look what it says here, verse 13. This is going to go on until, everybody say until. How many of you hate until? How many of you hate that? How many of you, I think this was, uh, Pastor Christian mentioned this, like, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? How many of you ever had parents say this, we'll get there when we? Oh, yeah, you know it, right? Like, this is, I hate until, like, I hate the waiting. Until is where we're living right now. He says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, look at this, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Like, this is going to be happening. This is going to keep going until we all attain the measure of the stature of Christ, until the church looks like Jesus. Like, that's what's going to happen until, the, until Jesus clearly comes into view in the church. Now, look up here. This is super important. Like, how long are we going to be at this? How long is this going to go on in our church? Like, how long do we have to keep going with serving and loving and doing all these things? Until the church looks like Jesus. Until people look at the church and they see Jesus. I want to tell you this. This is so important for us to understand. The measure of a great church is a church that looks like Jesus. The measure of a great church is not how good the music sounds. It's not how good the preaching is. It's not how nice the people are. It's not how big the buildings are. The measure of a great church is a church through which the world sees who? Jesus. When we look like Jesus, that's what God's goal is. That's what he's up to. How many of you have a ways to go in your life to look like Jesus? Come on, just be honest. Half of you and half of you are lying right now, right? Like, how many of you, like, you, your friend didn't raise their hand, but you know God's got some work to do? Like, you're like, I wonder. And uh, how many of you would agree that maturity brings growing pains? How many of you have ever had growing pains in your life? Like, like to grow up and become, it's growing pains. Matter of fact, I thought I'd do this this morning for just a minute. How, I've had growing pains in my life. I wanted to just show you a few pictures of my growing pains, okay? So, like, I'm going to take you through my life really quickly in the next couple minutes. First, here it is. Here's a picture of me. I am one year old. I weigh 30 pounds at a year old. Yes, can you imagine trying to walk at 30 pounds at a year old? I actually started walking at eight months old. And, I mean, that's, that's a beefcake right there, right? And then, and then and you go through, how many of you, you, most of you don't remember, but your parents do the growing pains. Like, you've got to go through teething. 
right? You want to, you, sometimes you gnaw on things. Uh, you're learning how to walk. You want people to pick you up all the time, oh, right? And they're like, no, you got to learn how to walk. And you bang yourself around, okay? And then you make it to grade school. Here's a grade school picture of me. Wow. <laughs> Look at the hair and teeth. Isn't that amazing? I'm just saying that to get your eyes off that shirt I'm wearing, okay? And I want to thank my mom for making me wear that shirt and make my dad, I want to thank him for making me button it all the way up to the top, right? Isn't that the ugliest thing? Like, how many of you remember grade school growing pains? Anybody? Right? Like, you, you, you just do stupid stuff in grade school. Your parents do stupid stuff to you in grade school. You go through it, and then you hit junior high. Here's a junior high picture of me. <laughs> I look high. I'm not, but my eyes are like halfway down. And look at that amazing hair. Isn't that incredible? My wife used to rub her fingers through my hair and say, you're never going to lose your hair. Look how much hair you have. Isn't that incredible? And then, and then uh, you go into high school. You make it out of junior high. You get into high school. There's me as a senior in high school, and I weighed 138 pounds. I want to know what happened. All right? Like... I had the lowest body fat and the largest amount of hair on my wrestling team, okay? As a senior in high school, lowest body fat, the most hair. And then here's me after four kids. I want you to see this picture because growing pains. I have no hair. And I now have the highest body fat on the team called my family, okay? How many of you go through growing pains in your life, right? Like changes, things happen. And this this is what's going to happen, like, until we all attain unity of faith and knowledge of Jesus, until we reach mature manhood and the full measure of the stature of Christ, until we look like Jesus. Like, this is going to happen in our lives. This goes on in congregations, too. You know, as the congregation grows, how many believe there are people that Jesus wants to be a part of his masterpiece? How many believe there are people that are not here yet? And when the church grows, like things happen, we go through growing pains. I, I was watching, I stopped by to see um, Caleb and Haley, and they brought Sarah home when they brought her home the second time. And I'm watching my two other rugrat granddaughters, like trying to adjust and figure out what life's going to be like, because now mom and dad are focused on a new little baby in the house. And like, do you love me? And where do I fit in? And how does this work? Right? And how many of you know, we go through the same thing in church sometimes where it's like, hey, the pastor doesn't have as much time for me or, or, or I'm not getting the attention I once was. And, and, and we can kind of wonder, like, where do I stand or where's my place in all of this? I'll never forget when John Wimber, told, John Wimber told the story. John Wimber was like a hippie, gave his life to Jesus, became a pastor. And this one older lady in his church came up to him. She was crying and she said, Pastor John, Pastor John. She goes, all these hippies and all these new people come in, they're ruining our church, they're ruining our church. And I'll never forget, John Wimber tells a story that he took, he took her by her face, he put his hands on her cheeks, and he just wept with her and said, I know they are. I know they are. How many know it's hard? Growing pains are hard. But this is part of a process of what God's taking us through. And growing pains, like your comfort zone disappears. People, we lose our power. We lose our parking spot. Someone's sitting in our seat. And our butt prints in it, well, how could they not tell? That's my seat, right? Like, and we go through growing pains in our own life as well. How many, you know, we go through, it's not just in a church, but we go through growing pains in our own life. I mentioned this earlier, like, when I was young, when I first met my wife and we got married and we started having kids, my pastor's wife told me, she said, there's no such thing as a young gentleman. I was like, what are you talking about? There is for the first time. He's right here, right? Like, and then, and, then, and then you realize, like, after years go by, you're like, wow, I, I had a lot of growing up to do. Like, I'll never forget when Amy was pregnant with Caleb, and she's getting near the time of giving birth to Caleb, and we both got on the scale in the morning to weigh ourselves. And I was like, look, Amy, we weigh the same. Isn't that cool? How many of you know I had some growing up to do? <laughs> right? Or we're in the hospital. She's giving birth to Caleb, and I'm watching. Instead of paying attention to my wife, I'm eating a hamburger, watching the little thing, you know, like, this is a big contraction. This is a big one. And she's like, I know it is. I fail it right now. I mean, you know, I had growing up to do, right? You have this maturity that has to happen. So you're like, whoa. And there are seasons in life we just look ugly. 
Like how many of you have seasons in your life as Christ followers, you're like, man, that was an ugly time. I did not look like Jesus that time. I did not treat my wife or my kids or, man, at work, I blew it or I got myself into something I should not have and I did not look like Jesus. How many know we all have times like this in our life? We reflect on our life. There's growing pains in this. Paul goes on to say in verse 14, God's doing all this so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves. Some of you are living there right now, right? Like, Life is a mess, just boosh, boosh. Everything gets shaken. That we no longer be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine and human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Like I said, some of you are living there right now. When I, when I was a kid, um, how many of you remember things like differently when you were a kid and you, you grew up and you're like, oh, it wasn't the way I thought it was, right? Like my grandma taught me that when there were thunderstorms, that was angels in heaven bowling. Yeah, that was great advice until, like, the angels struck down our pear tree in the backyard with lightning, right? Like, like, like and, and we just, things scare us and frighten us, and God's like, hey, there's a day coming when this won't be anymore, but there's lots of false doctrine rocking people today. Like, everybody, all religions are the same, and there's many roads to the same place, or just good people go to heaven, and, and I, I can be good enough. That's called self-righteousness, or... Truth is relative. You have your truth and I have my truth. Or the resurrection's an idea. It's, it didn't actually really happen. It's just an idea. Can I just tell you, and we're going to be done in a minute, what you believe actually matters. It really does. Let me give you a for instance. Let's say you're getting on a plane and you want to go to Venice, Italy. How many of you like to take that trip, right? But you end up in Venice, Florida. How many think there's a big difference? You're like, I got on the plane, I really thought it was going to Venice, Italy, but now you're sitting in Venice, Florida. How many of you know what you believe actually matters? It really matters. Or you jump out of a building that's 30 stories high. You jump out of a building because you want to fly, and you're like, whoa, look at me, I'm flying, I'm flying. How many of you know you're not actually flying, you're falling? But for a while, 30 stories, you can think you're flying, but how many of you know a hard cold, fast reality is about to hit you called cement, right? Like what you believe actually matters. And God wants to take us from being a mess into a masterpiece. He says in verse 15, rather speak the truth in love. We're to grow up in every way into him who's the head, into Jesus. This is why we're going to keep preaching from the Bible because the Bible's the truth. And we're going to keep preaching from it. It's how we grow from a mess into a masterpiece. We're supposed to grow up. Our lives are supposed to look different today than they did yesterday, and they're supposed to look different tomorrow. We're to grow up into every way into Jesus in our home life, our work life, our private life, our love life, our financial life. Look what it looks like when it's finished. Here it is. Verse 16, last verse I'll read to you. From whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's look up here for a minute as we close. Those of the, you that are watching in Softer Sunday or online, just hang with me because how many of you know it's hard for us when we look at the church today to think that the church is gonna actually look the way that God wants it to look? Like, I mean, it's, it's hard to see, but it's gonna be amazing. The, God's glory will be seen in the church and through his people. It will happen as surely as the Lord lives. And as surely as his glory will fill the earth, one day you and I surely will look like Jesus. It will happen. Some of you are like, there's no way. Like, I'm, I've just tried and tried. My life's a mess. I can't get it together. As surely as the Lord lives, and as surely as his glory will fill the earth, you will look like Jesus. He who started a good work in you will not quit at it until it's complete, until it happens in your life. Sometimes it's hard to see. 
Sometimes when you look at the church today, we can think, no way, like this is never going to happen. Do you see all the people fighting and all the messed up lives and how ugly the church looks sometimes and how leaders keep falling and, and like people are a mess and people say they're Christians and they don't act like it. And how can you say this is going to happen? I'm not the one who promised that it's going to happen. God is the one who said he's going to make it happen. As surely as he lives... One day, Jesus will be seen in the church. And it reminds me of the prophet Isaiah. It said when Jesus came, he was not attractive. There was nothing desirous that would attract people to him. He was like a, like a young plant that nobody even noticed. And I feel like the church is like that a lot of times. If I'm on the outside looking in, I'm like, why would I want to be a part of that? Why would I want to go to a business meeting and have a church fight? Like I have enough fights in my family and why would I want to be a part of all those angry Christians and people who have, they're still messed up. Why would I want to be a part? And how many of you know, there's sometimes we look at the church and there's like, there's really nothing, like what's desirous about being a part of, of this? But I'm telling you, God's gonna do something amazing. Every person's going to be doing their part. We're all going to be working properly. You're not going to be trying to be me. I'm not going to be trying to be you. We're going to be doing a great job loving each other. Matter of fact, this is how the whole world will know that we're Christ followers. Jesus said, the whole world will know that you're my followers by your love for one another. You're like, is that going to happen? Yeah, that's going to happen. It really is. I, I, I said this last week, and I, I close with this, and I know we're late into the, into the morning, but I just want to, I feel like the church has body image issues. And if you were talking to a young lady who's like got body image issues, you know, so many young girls, you talk to them, they, they look in the mirror, they can't see that they're beautiful, they just see their flaws and their failures, and you'd never sit there and just point them all out, would you? You'd never do that to them and say, you're right, you're ugly, look at you, you look terrible. You wouldn't do that, you'd be like, honey, you don't see, you can't see how beautiful you really are. Come on, how many of you are with me, right? And yet, I think the body of Christ, we do this to ourselves. We look in the mirror and we point out all of our flaws and our failures and our shortcomings. And look how ugly you are and look how messed up you are here and look how messed up you are here. And we get our, we get our eyes on all of the flaws. I don't think it's going to help us. I don't think it's going to help us to point them all out or call other Christians out on Facebook. I don't think it's going to help us to talk bad about one another, put, point out the flaws. And how many of you know a lot of those flaws are very real? Like, they're there. You can see them, right? I don't think it's going to help us to point them out. Matter of fact, I've determined, like, I, we can either look at our flaws or we can look at our future. And I'm choosing to look at our future. I trust that if God says one day this messed up bunch of people is going to look like my son and Jesus is going to shine through, that's what I'm putting my eyes on right there. And I'm counting on that. How many of you are with me? That, hey, we're trusting you, God, to do this in us and among us. And we're going to focus not on our failures, but on our future. Would you bow your head with me as we close our time together? And as you bow your head, I just... I want to ask you, like, what is God saying to you today? What is God saying to you in this moment? Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never just surrendered and said, God, I want to be a part of your masterpiece. 